following is brought to you by Severn Christian Church, a family church where your life matters. You turn in your Bibles to first, Second Peter 3, 17 and 18. I want to start there. And therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand... Be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to to eternity. We're in a series, and uh, today's sermon title is Journey to Grow. And um, as I thought about the idea of a journey, it came to mind, Judy and I's 25th anniversary, that we were able, and by God's hand and the church leadership, able to uh, take a journey across the country. And uh, 3,700 miles, uh, we were uh, driving and we are together, and... Um, and so what a journey it was. We had no idea uh, the kind of blessings we received from God as we went on this journey. We had several goals as we went. And uh, the first one, I think, was to go there and back again. We wanted to come back home. And I remember getting all the way out there and thinking, we're 3,000 miles away from our family. Will we ever see each other again? But I didn't hold that thought very long as I didn't want to ruin the, the journey. But we had several goals. One was to enrich our marriage. And uh, I think this is the landmark, something G- Judy said, and I hear her still say it. She goes, we didn't argue the whole time. So we, we, did, we enriched our marriage. It, it, was, it was great. Another goal was to see God's glory in the creation. And oh my, uh, we were in a van and it just became a picture window. All the vistas. So many times, look at this, look at that, oh my. All the different things that kind of grabbed a hold of us. We went to the Black Hills of uh, Montana, you, Alex and Amber will be heading back there not too long from now. And uh, I can understand why they go back. God's creation, when you hit the mountains, is unbelievable. And uh, we went to Yellowstone, the Bighorn Mountains. And uh, we went to the Redwood Forest in California. And you just feel like a little ant when you get next to those trees. It's amazing, the creation. How can these trees grow so enormous like they were? And uh, we went to Pacific Coast and watched the sunset that first night and uh, saw the ocean really is blue. There were some seals out there bobbing in the water and something we only really saw on TV up until uh, that point in time. And uh, the Hoover Dam and the Grand Canyon, uh, that Grand Canyon, you could see God's mighty work as he flooded the world in ancient of times and reformed the whole world as it is today out of water. It was just amazing. See God's glory. And then we went to visit some friends. We did that, the Shanks and the Sutmans. We visited them in California in the middle of the country. But I think the primary reason why we went was to do some healing. We needed some healing. Esther had passed away. We had lost long life friends from the church during the church split. And it was a time to heal. And it was a healing time for us. Uh, we took Esther's ashes and we put them on her farm in Indiana where she grew up. And, uh, and then we scattered them all the way, the rest of the country. I think the last place we left her was the Pacific Ocean, right, hon? And uh, so I think she always wanted to go there. And it's just symbolic for that. But you know, God overwhelmed us. And uh, we can't count his blessings. And we'll probably talk about it to the day when the days are gone. He revived us. And you see, the church is on a journey. And I'm just wondering if you want to go on that journey yourself. And so you have to answer that question this morning. Are you willing to take the journey? Because we are one body. We are one in Christ. We are the family of God. We're the household of faith. And God wants to take the church and every generation on a journey with him. And that journey is to grow and mature and to be useful to God in a time such as this. So I hope you're willing to go this morning. 
When we open the Bible to chapter 3 here in, uh, for, in 2 Peter, the third chapter, he first begins to say, Church, I'm stirring up your mind and your heart to remember something. To remember that you are my church. To remember that I am your God. To remember that there will be a time when God will send Jesus back and judge the world in his righteous way. There'll be a time, if you're still here, that you'll go from your body and meet him in the air. It'll be a time like you've never could imagine in your own mind, but it's going to happen. And he says, be on guard. Watch your life. There's going to be deceitful religions to pull you out of the ark of God's church. And so he's stirring up our memories there in chapter 3, telling us also that the day will come like in the days of Noah. You don't know when the Lord's coming back, but he will come, and this time it won't be just to destroy the earth and start over again, but he'll take all things away that can be burned up. The only thing that remains is spiritual. And then here in verse 13, he commands us to grow. You see that? It's a commandment. So God desires that we grow. He puts it like this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow by it. And when I read that, the first thing that came to my mind was, was the little Piper, and I saw she was over here this morning for a moment, okay? Little, sweet, teeny, tiny, little Piper. But when that girl is hungry, her little mouth squares up, and she screams, and you hold your ears until you get that bottle in her mouth. So God wants us to be the same way about the pure milk of his word. He wants us to thirst for it. That begins a growth process. That little girl's going to grow up. Don't you love the stages of kids and child growth? It's amazing. But see, God God has made all living, physical, natural things to grow. When I was a kid growing up, I loved watching things grow. And uh, remember the, and I think they're still out there too, sea monkeys. Remember sea monkeys? And uh, you get a little aquarium, you get these little tea, uh, little packet of eggs, you dump it in there, and man, I couldn't wait the next day to see if the sea monkeys are growing, you know? And the picture they show, they're playing tennis, and they're a family and everything, they got these big googly eyes, and they make them look like monkeys, but really, as you grow up, you find out they're just brine shrimp. That's all they are. But how about, um, have, have it, did anybody ever have uh, magic crystal rocks? Raise your hand. Did you have, see, I'm not that old. Magic crystal rocks. And now uh, you put them in the little terrarium thing, fill it up with water, cap it off, and every day you come. And I watch them rocks grow up. And uh, if you have them long enough, they eventually crumble, don't they? But I'll remember my first chemistry set. How many had one of them? See, when I was growing up, they were kind of big, you know, chemistry sets. And, um, you know, so you do your different experiments and everything. If you have a microscope, you look under it and stuff. And uh, finally, I get bored with the chemistry set. I say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get up my Bunsen burner and get out one of the beakers, and I'm going to put every chemical in the, in the set in the beaker. Have, haven't you done that? Yeah, yeah, I've done that. And all of a sudden, it's growing out of the beaker. It's falling out of the beaker, on the table, and on the floor. We named it the blob. It wouldn't stop growing. Right, okay. <laughs> uh, and that was the Hollandtown girl. It was close enough. But how about springtime? I love the spring. Everything starts growing naturally. Uh, my brother gave me a, a blue spruce, and it's in our, there in our front yard. And uh, according to how much rain it is, how much moisture it gets in the springtime, it grows these beautiful light, light green, and the, before the moss gets on it, turns it blue, beautiful, fresh green branch. You can see how much that, it, that tree grows all the time. And now, uh, how many garden? Raise your hand if you garden. Yeah, a lot of people like to garden everything. I, you know, it's amazing what comes from dirt, isn't it? I mean, just, you're just waiting. Like I got the, uh, matter of fact, we're, we're doing something new. It's the second year we put in straw garden. You ever hear that? You take a bale of straw and you line them up, put them together, and you plant on top of that. Yeah, no weeding, no tilling the ground. I mean, it is great. You only have a few weeds to pull out, but it works. It really works. And if you want to know about it, just let me know and I'll tell you. But anyway, and, and it's just amazing to watch things. I can't wait for them to pop out of the ground. As a matter of fact, they say, what, 
five to ten days or ten days, eight days, wherever you read the seeds and everything, it takes them to germinate and pop out. Ours popped out in four days. All right, so get your straw bales and start making them. But anyway, and so I like to watch things grow. And, uh, and how about all the type of tomatoes they have now? Where they have uh, big boys, you know, and then better boys. So they must be better than the big boys. Then they have beef steaks. And then uh, how about sandwich? When they have sandwich tomatoes now. I guess, I don't know, do they come out square or something? But anyway, they, they have sandwich tomatoes. You know, just grow, grow, grow. And uh, children, I mentioned earlier, isn't it amazing to watch children grow? To go through all the different stages. I remember uh, little McKenna, we're teaching him, you teach him grace is the first thing you get to teach him, right? Great, uh, to pray over their food. And uh, she really had a hard time with the second half, which is, and we thank him for our food. And uh, she would mumble that part out, and sometimes I thought of her saying, we thank him for our shoes. And uh, so different things would come out, you know. But finally she gets it, and we thank him for our food in the name of Jesus, you know. And uh, I remember it was a daycare, it was a celebration, it was the end of the year, it was the, um, uh, what is it, the graduation, right? They had graduation. And I said, well, I'm going to see if McKenna will do it. And I got her to come up. I said, McKenna, would you, you know, help me say grace for our food coming up? Not even a hesitation. God is great, God is good, and we thank him for our food in Jesus' name, amen. And just everybody, I looked up and they were crying, you know, this little wonderful voice saying that. But it's really amazing. When she finally got to the TH, she figured, got thank you down, your front teeth fall out. Then it's like, thank you, yeah, I said it. It's hard for them to talk. But isn't it amazing to watch things grow and watch God's creation? He designed it that way to naturally grow. But here, when it comes to us, he has to command us to grow. See, creation grows all by itself. And we even grow physically. But so often we don't grow into adulthood or maturity in Christ. We have to work at it, don't we? And he's making it clear here by a commandment. It doesn't happen naturally. God has to command it. And here he has to remind us of the bigger picture. He said, look, the world's going to end. So grow up. Get some growth going. You say, growth, the journey of growth is a choice, isn't it, for each one of us? Matter of fact, it's a choice you make this very moment. It's a choice you make when you wake up. It's a choice you make when you go to work, how you're going to act. The church only grows collectively when we each grow individually. And just as growing to adulthood is a journey, so is spiritual growth. We have to put effort into it. There's nothing sadder than a human being that doesn't grow up. It causes so many problems. Number one, our journey to grow begins when we glorify God. Look at verse 18 again. Notice this. The key to understanding and experiencing spiritual growth is found in verse 18. It says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory. Now look at this. Both now, today. That he be glorified now, today, and then forever. And then he says, amen. Growing in grace equate, is equivalent to giving glory to God. Hear me again, because this is, the, this is the bullet in the whole sermon, right here. Growing in grace is equated to giving glory to God. The key to the process of spiritual growth is understanding what it means to glorify God. Now, already this morning, if you listened to the words that you were singing, you were glorifying God. You were giving Him thanks. You were giving Him credit. You were giving Him honor. For being God. The greatest theme in all the universe, the universe itself, is the glory of God. It is actually the highest, or what we call the apex of revelation, the Bible itself. That we exist in order to glorify God, the one who created us. Here's a catechism from the 17th century. It's put it like this. That the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. I like that. Because that's intention, his intention, that we would uh, enjoy him. But that's reciprocated by us glorifying him first. And that's what we're going to see. In fact, the chief end of everything created is to glorify God. Let's start with the universe. In Psalms 19.1, it says this, The heavens declare the glory of God, and their expanse 
is declaring the work of his hands. The vastness of space glorifies God. Now, when they sent out the Hubble, I don't know exactly what they're looking for, but I think they said they're looking for our origin. And I don't know if it's a little green man they're looking for. I'm not sure. Or some civilization on a planet. But every time I see a Hubble picture, I see the handiwork, and it declares the glory of God. You see, man means it for his own ideas. He may try to expel the idea there's even a God and a creator. But when we see the Hubble, we see the expanse and glory of God, don't we? I love those pictures. Because my eye can't see that far. Can yours? And so the universe declares God's glory. And then the creation itself. Isaiah put it this way. Isaiah 55, 12. You go out in joy and go forth and be led by peace and the mountains and the hills burst into song before you. And all the trees of the field clap their hands. You see, God's glory is all around us in the creation. Now, have you ever seen a tree clap its hands? You ever see the mountains and the hills sing? Well, you didn't listen to the sound of the music, did you? The movie. But what's the idea behind that? That all around us externally, we can see the glory of God and the majesty of his design. That's why we go camping primarily. Parts to get away from you, but the other part is to, to be out there in creation. But it says in Isaiah 43 that the animals glorify God. The beasts of the field will glorify me, he says. Don't you think they thirst when there's a drought? And then when the rain comes down, they glorify God. It says that the angels glorify God. They sang it to Jesus when he was born. They sang it to the shepherds. Glory to God in the highest. You know, as I think about man trying to expand himself into the universe, into God's glory, I think, why is he going to a red planet? It reminds me of the devil going to Mars. But you know what? No matter where man goes, if he ever goes that far, he's just going to take his sin with him. I can see it now, the headlines. First murder on Mars. But all the universe is designed to give glory to God. As history is resolved in the book of Revelation, God sets up a glorious eternal kingdom, it says there, and a great song will be sung about God and the Lamb, and it goes like this. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they exist and were created. This is the purpose for everything in the creation, to worship and praise and glorify God. And they don't even have lips and hearts. Psalm 16 says this, though, about man, and it came from King David. He says, I have set the Lord always before me. Picture that in your mind. I set the Lord first, right in front of me all the time. I can see him. I know what he wants. So I've set the Lord ever before me. Therefore, my heart is glad. You know, we have a lot of suffering in our culture today, don't we? We have a lot of things to worry about. We bring a lot of that on ourselves. And David's saying this, if you want gladness in your heart, if you want joy, put me before you continually. In other words... All that he did, he focuses on the glory of God, and that makes him joyful. This is an exchange that God designed. You give me glory, I'll give you joy. We exist in order to glorify God, just as the wonder and design of the world that God created. But we're the highest of that order, aren't we? Didn't he give us the creation to subdue and to enjoy and to prosper? Yes. Look at the great comforts we have right now. Hear that and feel it? What is it? Air conditioning, man. We're so used to it. In our cars, everywhere we go, I think I'll put one in my tree house. That'll be next. 
But the journey to grow starts with individuals. God wants you to strike you in your heart where you sit. And he wants you to come to the place where you begin to give glory to him first above all things. And as we individuals glorify God, the whole church then will rise up and give thanks. And God collectively will use our influence around the community. Now, last week we sang this. Listen to it. I'm not going to sing it. I'm going to read it. But I might sing it, so don't laugh now down there. Creator God, you gave me breath so I could praise your great and matchless name all my days, all my days. So let my whole life be a blazing offering, a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Number two on your outline. The journey to grow begins when we change to the image of his glory. When we change the image of glory. 2 Corinthians 3.18 puts it like this. This is a monumental verse written by the Apostle Paul to that first century church who had a lot of problems. But by the time you get down to 2 Corinthians, a lot of healing has taken place. And Paul first says, but we all Christians are with unveiled faces. In the Old Testament, there was a veil because the law could never save. It covered the eyes of all those who were under the law and those who hardened their heart against God. And the only way that that veil is removed is in Jesus Christ when people come to the knowledge of him. But as a result, things are no longer hidden from us, Bible things, especially prophecy. Now we don't have to search like the prophets did to understand what they wrote. The veil is lifted. We can learn as much as we want, and God will bring understanding. All has been fulfilled in Jesus. The only prophecies left is the day that Jesus comes back. We just have to be ready for that, as he said. But look at verse 18, the second part. It says that we are changed, transformed, some of your translations may say, into the same image, Jesus' glory, glory to glory, even as a spirit of the Lord. You see, the goal to be changed is to be changed in the image of Jesus' glory. And that's why we study him. That's why we praise him. That's why we worship him. That's why we walk in his ways. When we walk in the spirit, we walk the way Jesus walked. We want to live in his glory, the the glory he passed around. So, So we need to be more and more like him every day. Don't we, just by nature, like to be like somebody else? We're not so happy with ourselves, so we want to be, you know, like Mike or or somebody. There's somebody we want to be like, and we emulate, and we do that very naturally because that's what we do. But you see, when we honor him and glorify him, he glorified us first by saving us, and then we glorify him by the change and transforming process. So if you want to glorify God, grow. If you want to make Jesus happy, you want to walk in his image, grow. Ask yourself, what do I reflect as a human being and especially as a Christian? You know, way back in college, Judy said her first impression of me is that I was a jock. And, uh, you know, that's somebody who likes sports, in case you don't know what that term means. And, um, and that was at first glance, but uh, she didn't know me up close yet. And uh, so I guess uh, she rejected that idea since she married me. <clears throat> But the next time you look in the mirror, don't look at just your pretty face. But look to see if you look more like Jesus today. Most of the time when we look in the mirror, we don't see ourselves as other people see us. You see, they see more than just our physical person. They see what you carry around. They see your character and what you give off and what you carry around in your person. 
So look next time and see what Jesus sees when you look in the mirror. Ask, am I changing to reflect His glory? Am I like Him in His compassion? Do I love the way that He loves? Is my body giving off the light of kindness to people? Do I stop to talk to strangers? You know, there's no strangers to Jesus, is there? Should be no strangers to us. Do I look to help someone? Do I leave time for others for the kingdom's sake? Because we'll make no disciples unless we're willing to do that. And that's what Jesus was willing to do. He said in John 15 these words, very familiar to you. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do absolutely zero nothing. That's why we need to walk in his glory and his image and do that transforming. When we submit to his image, we bear fruit. We grow in our effectiveness in our witness. Isn't it true that when we hang around each other, that we sort of like get like each other in a way? And uh, that's why they say in marriage, you become one. You think the same, and the same thing's on your idea. You may say the same thing at the same time, you know. And um, if you ever hang around Rick, for example, you start laughing like him, don't you? It's kind of, that's why they call it an infectious laugh. You see, we, we do that naturally, don't we? And we could do the same as we walk close to Jesus and we walk in his ways and in his steps. We can't bear fruit without him. Now, right down here, uh, or some baptismal certificates, and um, you know the you know God enhances our ability to be like Jesus, to walk in His image by giving us the Holy Spirit. He empowers us with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control and faithfulness. He's given all that to us if we'll walk in His ways. And uh, evidence of that is right down here. Is a couple of baptismal certificates, and uh, is Sherry and Dave here? I don't think they're here. They're probably down at their down in South Carolina somewhere. But, um, you know, Sherry is a perfect example of bearing the fruit of joy. Isn't she a joyous person? You've been around her? And, uh, you, know, you know, some people get wrinkles in their eyes because they're getting old. Some people get wrinkles in their eyes because they have so much joy. Their eyes are always squinting from laughing. And that's how Sherry is. Now, don't tell her I said that thing about the wrinkles. But anyway, <laughs> that's, that's, but she carries joy with her. But I'll tell you something else she has. She has the spirit of faithfulness to tell people about Jesus, doesn't she? There's a testimony of two people right there this morning because she shares her faith. She walks in the image of Jesus Christ. When we're willing to change and transform in His image, He lets us bear fruit, doesn't He? When we get out of our own way, Act like the Lord. People say, what's different about you? I want to know. And then you get a chance to tell them. But as we grow, the church grows. Didn't we grow last week a little bit, if anything, convicted when Colin was preaching with us? And his last point was this. Just because you know a lot, or because you're intellectually gifted and you think you got it, doesn't mean you act like a Christian, that you're safe in Jesus. And Colin, you let those tears flow, buddy, because you know what that tells us? God opposes the proud, he gives grace to the humble. And that's convicted tears that we all needed, didn't we? You see, God wants us to grow. He wants us to walk in the image of Jesus. and He'll use us to bear that fruit. Number three, the journey to grow begins when we trust in the presence of Jesus and the future of his glory. Throughout biblical history, God has attempted in a variety of ways to enable us to see his glory. For example, in the garden, when Adam and Eve lived there, the Bible says this, they heard the voice of the Lord God in the cool of the day. Before the fall, they lived in the presence of God. The Hebrews had a word for this idea. It was called Shekinah. You've heard it before. The word means to dwell or to reside. And so they lived with the Shekinah of God. According to John 4.24, 
It says that God is spirit. We know God is also light. And so he didn't dwell there with them with a body like ours. Then how did he manifest himself, we have to ask. Some believe he appeared in his glorious, incandescent, brilliant light that we see all through the Bible. The presentation of God was his infinite and eternal glory that dwelt with Adam and Eve. But then they sin and are cast out of the presence of God and they forfeit that presence and glory of God. But then we come to Moses. Moses gets the law. He's in God's presence. He has this great fear. Not only a fear to teach or fear to speak for God, he has this fear like, how are they going to know you're behind all this? How do they know it's going to be you? And he says, look, by the blessings I give them, they'll know. For Moses, that wasn't enough. He says, I want to see you. I want to see this glory. So God says, okay. You know, sometimes we just wear God out, don't we? Okay. So he puts him in the cleft of the rock so he can't jump out. And then it says he holds his hand as he goes by. And he only really gets to see the afterglow of God behind him. And so when he comes down the mountain, his face is glowing to say, he's glowing. What is this? He must have been with God. But then he had to wear a veil because the glory would fade away, just like the wall was going to fade away that he was freshly given to those people. The Shekinah glory was symbolized when they built a tabernacle and it would uh, pillar of fire, pillar of cloud. Any time that it rose up out of the tabernacle, it was time for them to move. They had to pack the whole thing up and go. And that was God's presence. By the time we get down to the temple, on the big day of the temple inauguration, it says they were there worshiping God and doing their very best, bringing as many bowls and, and, and had the chorus singing and the, and the choir going and the, and the band playing, the orchestra playing, giving God everything they possibly could, giving this beautiful edifice that he directed them to build with the riches from all around the world, kings and queens bringing all the things that they need to build the temple of God. And then on that day of dedication, Isaiah, I mean, um, Solomon just cries because there's no way you can house the glory of God. And then a cloud comes down as the priests are giving offering, and they had to stop and get out of there. So the Shekinah of God was there. But then by the time you get down to the days of Ezekiel, we hear, Ezekiel, we hear this term called Ichabod. Uh, when, the first time I ever heard as a kid was Ichabod Crane. Remember that? Some of you do. And um, Ichabod meant the glory has departed. And so all through history, God tried to reveal his mighty hand and his glory, uh, and man just rejected it. And uh, finally, in John 1.14, it says this about Jesus. John wrote this, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, Shekinah. And we beheld his glory, glory as the only begotten of the Father. That's why it says of Jesus, when he comes into the land of Naphtali and Zebulun, that the world had seen a great light as he came along. But Jesus embodied the glory of God, the Shekinah of God. In Luke 9, 29, it says this, After Jesus went up into the mountain to pray, he was transfigured. It says there in Luke, His face had changed and his clothes were white and gleaming. Now, today we may use other words, but that's the words that John used. In verse 32, it says, Peter, James, and John saw his glory, and Jesus showed them who he really was. See, one final time, God shows mankind, here's my glory. Will you honor me in Jesus? Will you glorify me in your body? In your life. God revealed his glory to Jesus. Not just in Eden. Not just on the face of Moses. Not in the sky, in the tabernacle, and in the tent. But in the Lord Jesus. And what did the world say at that time? And let me ask you this. What does the world say today about Jesus? Luke nineteen fourteen, Jesus' own words. We will not have this man reign over us. And then John nineteen fifteen. eventually the crowd said, crucify him. Once again, people tragically turned their backs 
on his glory. But there's going to come a day in the future when man won't have the opportunity anymore. When Jesus returns, he said that he's coming in the cloud, the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Revelation 6, 15 and 16, it says that the people who saw him will cry out for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them to hide themselves from his presence. And why? Because next time he's coming in a great glory that the world has never seen. Maybe even a blindness that would cause them to flee and make such a request. His glory will fill the whole earth. And there won't be any options left for humankind. Finally, he will have his glory on that day. All creation will sing glory to the Lamb, glory to God in the highest. And ultimately, Jesus will have his glory. So in the past, God endeavored to get man to see his glory. In the future, he'll display his glory in a way that gives no other option in that moment. So what about the present? What about right now where we sit, who we are as God's church? What now is the significance of God's glory? In Ephesians 3, 19 and 21, listen to this. Paul desires this, that we be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask, To him be glory in the church. That's us. You see, that God would be glorified now through the church. All those other things happened in the past and was tragically omitted from man's mind and his heart. He didn't accept God's Shekinah glory in his presence in all those different ways. And then we rejected him himself through his son. But yet as believers, we know he's coming back in all the glory that we anticipate and forevermore. So in the Old Testament, God showed the glory through the temple, through the tent, through the face of Moses, in the sky and in the garden, in the future. But now he displays his coming through us. Right now, the glory of God should be displayed in the church. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 puts it this way. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts To give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. You know what that's saying? God had it planned a long time ago. Not only for your redemption, but for us to shine that light. That's why Jesus says, be a light that shines everywhere. He passed that glory on to us to glorify him in the midst of other people. You see, the journey to grow begins with glorifying God, doesn't it? putting him first, saying that I'm going to live and change to be like Jesus. And he promises you that joy when we put him first. And that joy in that class is overflows in a very dark world. Isn't this a, a bad time? We ought to feel insecure about our government. We should feel insecure about the whole world and what's happening around the globe. We're moving constantly towards a darkness and a rebellion towards God. And there's going to be a day when he's done. And then your loved one and our kids and our young people will not have another opportunity when the heavens open and the trumpet sounds. But in the meantime, we're on a journey. And if we grow individually, the church will grow. And God will fill these chairs. There's no room big enough for God's church if we're willing to glorify him first. So, Ben, you can come on out. I wasn't at their meeting. I didn't give them a cue. In um, 1 Corinthians one twenty seven, it says this, Christ is in you, the hope of glory. So every baptized believer has the hope of glory living in us. Now we can suffocate that, we can let it out. But also, without the hope of glory, you're hopeless. And so if you haven't made a decision to completely surrender your life to God and have a desire to glorify Him in your life instead of yourself, God is calling all the time through His Word. And we call right now through the Word. 
God says, believe first. Believe in the story of Jesus. Believe in the Bible. Believe what it says about salvation. Believe that by grace we are saved, that God set it all up. And be willing to do that change, which is repentance. Repentance is say, I'm, I know I need to change. I know I don't give off the light of Jesus Christ. So repentance is being willing to do that, change your life. And stop doing what you want to do in the world, what you to do, but do for God. And then if we're willing to repent and then confess, not be ashamed of him in front of people, then we're baptized. And at baptism, that's where God forgives. He don't forgive when you just ask him. He forgives at a, perf- a perfect place where the sacrifice took place of Jesus Christ on the cross, where his blood was shed. Baptism is symbolized because we're buried, die to the old self, self, die with Jesus, rise and walk in the newness of life. It's new because you're forgiven, new because you get the gift of the Holy Spirit, whom Paul says is a promise from God, a pledge of your inheritance in heaven. And so let us stand and sing. If you have a decision to make this morning, come on down.